Okay, welcome back. This is the uh, last panel of the day. Uh, I think we've agreed that it's really been quite a day. Um, so uh, this last panel is called the three, th oh, here comes Ryan. Uh, he'll be joining the group. <laughs> so I'll uh, we'll give him a few seconds and then I'll really start. Great, okay, welcome. Okay, so this last panel of the day is called the 3,000 Mile Table Read, Producing Audiobooks During the Pandemic, uh, which we're two and a half, more than two and a half years into this now, and it's affected everything, including the world of audiobooks. Uh, it, you know, the, the audiobook uh, community and, and business is perhaps better positioned to deal with it than uh, many other uh, businesses, but uh, nevertheless, there have been some some unusual adaptations and inventions and innovations along the way. So that's what we'll be talking about. And uh, we're joined by Ryan DeLusung, Michael Kramer, David Shin, Sue Zizza, Richard Romaniello, and Ann Damon. So. Um, to get things started off, I mean, uh, perhaps each of you could relate, you know, what's the, uh, the, the most unusual or the least expected <laughs> result of all this, or the, the you know, what, what was the new experience? You know, there are many, we, people have been able to record remotely for a long time, but we're in a, we're in a new era now. Oh, uh, you want to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I think it's that audio has finally gotten its due. It's finally gotten its recognition as a major player in the entertainment industry. I think that's one of the biggest joys for me as a person who's been producing for 30 plus years, um, that we weren't any longer, in fact, we were a major player. I, as I mentioned before, I teach at NYU, and I said to my students, because on Friday, March 6th, I said, I'll see you next week. And the following Sunday, I was told, no, you're not coming back ever again. We don't know how long. So I reached out to them, and I said, remember, we are content creator warriors. We work in the entertainment industry. There is no late because we're broadcasters, we have to be on time, we have to meet deadlines, we have to meet release dates. And so I, I really you know, kept that concept, being a warrior in my mind, and move forward from there. And I just think that audio finally has been repositioned to be a major player again. Well, at, at Penguin Random House, uh, we realized we have 14 recording studios, 10 in uh, Woodland Hills, California, and four in New York City, as well as using outside studios. And even with the 14 studios during pre-pandemic, we still did a tremendous amount of work out of house. And all of those studios closed, we closed our studios, and we put out a call to people, and we started, we started Ahab before that, but Ahab being a, a database for, for uh, audiobook readers. And um, then we put out kind of an APB saying, listen, if you got a setup at home, you know, we'll help you t uh, tune it, and let's, let, we have to continue working. So we have a database of just about 900 readers from all over the world, not necessarily just this country, but all over the world. And what I do, a big part of my job now, is they send me audio samples, I listen to it, and I say, okay, well, this is, you got a bit of a noise floor problem, or uh, a lot of people, I don't know why, David, maybe you know this, <laughs> are using shotgun mics. <laughs> I'm really not a fan. And, uh, but uh, there are people out there with, with uh, a $79 mic, $150 uh, uh, interface, and they think they're ready to make audiobooks. And really, if you were to go to a, a, a studio to record an audiobook, there's gonna be a microphone, generally a high quality preamp, a compressor limiter, and an equalizer generally in the circuit. Not doing a lot of tweaking with the equalizer. And that's a real big difference. So what I tend to tell a lot of these home recordists is that, yeah, that's okay to have that, that, that 
$79 mic, but you really need something between the mic and the interface to really give it the, the professional sound. Now again, the, the biggest component in anybody's um, home recording studio system is the room itself, and that is the hardest thing to control. But there are ways around it, and now that there's the software that's out there, it cleans up a lot of mistakes that we would not have been able to clean up not that long ago. But um, I spend a tremendous amount of time helping people get their setup, whether it be a closet. Some of them have better studios than we have in our own facilities, but the majority of them have you know, a relatively inexpensive microphone, a relatively inexpensive uh, interface, and, and what I try to tell them is that you know, you're competing with people that have gone out and spent 3,500 bucks on a mic, $3,500 on a preamp, $10,000 on a booth. Uh, you know, one, at, at some point, we're gonna go back to the studio, and, but we will still be using folks from their home studio, so it, it would behoove you to uh, improve the quality of your equipment as, as you get more experience. And I offer, I spend tremendous amount of time on the phone or Zoom calls with, with um, readers uh, or narrators to help them get the best possible sound. And, um, and I enjoy it, you know. Um, I'm a yapper, as you can probably tell. And, um, but I, 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 listen, I love this work. I was, you know, rudderless at 26 years old and found a career, or it found me, and I've been grateful ever since. So I like doing as much as I can to help folks in this particular venture. Uh, I'm, I have one of those studios at home. <laughs> um, I've been recording in, in uh, at home for 25 years. Uh, and gradually, as more money came in, yeah, we, every improvement you can make, uh, you do. Uh, some of it you do for your own comfort. Some of it you do to limit the number of interruptions um, uh, and to keep yourself cool because the hardest, the hardest thing to do is sound comfortable when you're pouring sweat. <laughs> uh, and in a small room, one body generates a whole lot of heat. Uh, with regard to the pandemic, um, pandemic didn't really change anything because even before the pandemic, uh, I was occasionally working when I wasn't self-monitoring uh, and self-directing. I was occasionally working with remote directors anyway, and that was just a question of patching them in. Uh, to me, the exciting thing that, that the technology, I think, has been spurred to do is eventually doing what you guys are doing which is solving the latency problem so that you can do true duet or true multi-voice things um, across the country. Across uh, the world. Well, that, um, because um, I just literally finished uh, a, what is called a duet narration where, I mean, it, to put that in layman's terms, it's not solo du narration where your one voice is telling the whole story. It's not dual where one voice is is covering one point of view and another voice will be covering another point of view. It's, uh, I covered part of the direct narr the narrative and then all the male voices. And then there was another uh, voice actor, uh, Andrea Ems, who covered, oh, yeah, uh, who covered also some of the narrative and all the female voices, um, but we did it separately. We were not in the same studio at the same time, so, which to me, and that's called duet. Um, I call it a hybrid duet because true duet, would we would both be in the same studio or we would at least be recording the same material at the same time so that I can literally hear her say the line and I can respond to it in time as opposed to I'm guessing what she's gonna, how she's going to say the line and she's guessing how I'm going to respond. Um, if you're experienced and or if the material isn't too, what I would call tricky, that, that will work. But there will be material that you really want to hear exactly the nuance that the other person is providing so that you can respond with your fine-tuned response as well. And that to me is what's exciting. And it will allow for 
I'm not gonna call it a richer experience, I'm gonna call it a different experience. Mm -hmm. uh, solo narration can be as effective as dual, as duet, as multi-voice. But I think the, the challenges for that you're gonna speak to in terms of solving the latency issues uh, when you're in two different locations, time zones, whatever, uh, to make it so that you can really perceive the timing um, without having to edit is, is what's gonna be really uh, exciting. And also allows you to work with directors, like the few times I've worked, they're in different time zones as well. It's like, no, I can't do that. I'm not getting up at seven um, because you're three time zones ahead of me um, and you're not getting up you know, at five in the morning because I'm five time zones ahead of you. Uh, but uh, Sue is absolutely right. Uh, we were, in the entertainment world, we were the only, body wor only people working mm -hmm. because everybody else needed to have be in the same room and we didn't. And Man, many uh, theaters too were, were yeah. closed um, for a, a long, long time. Still closed. Uh, One of the things I did was work with a number of theater companies to help them stay open and maintain their subscription bases by turning their big main stage productions into audio. So that was really, you know, a, a, I'm telling you, the audio industry just burgeoned during this time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You were, you were saying, Ryan, I didn't mean to. Oh, no, no, I was just chiming in also. Um, <coughs> I think my, my experience as one of the newer narrators was certainly trying to figure out how a space can work in the home. Um, you mentioned uh, um, about closet space. I mean, that's still my, uh, my workspace from home. And then... Um, trying to get the noise floor as quiet as possible <laughs> and have the producer on the other end be happy with that mm -hmm. or as happy as possible. And um, trying to do that in the home with uh, what Laura was talking about earlier about planes outside. For me, every Friday, there's the mowers outside. <coughs> there's um, you know maybe a dog barking out outside um, or even just in the home where you've got... Uh, someone closing the bathroom door on the other end of the hall and that comes through and uh, or maybe the laundry machine comes through and you you know <laughs> frustratingly you know, grumble to yourself and say ah shut up but uh, I mean y you kind of just have to keep going but I know for me in terms of say l l speaking of latency um, and having a live director uh, I, I do some voice work for this company, uh, someone, I think it was Laura mentioned earlier, Graphic Audio is a, a, a local Bethesda, Rockville-based uh, voice audiobook company that adapts comic books and graphic novels. And sometimes trying to get that worked out live is challenging because uh, going to what you said about um, uh, Michael Kramer, about um, people being on different parts of the world uh, there was this one director who lives in California and they would regularly have to get up at five in the morning uh, just to be able to meet with me uh, over this app called Discord and just chat through uh, the lines. And <laughs> it, it, it's on my end, you know, it's, it's uh, someone who's not so technically or technologically profound, as some of the producers here, uh, trying to get the latency issue and even just volume issues between the two parties is is really challenging. And then and then you have to uh, remember, okay, I'm there reading text for this this project, and the balancing of all these different things from the technological perspective to the artistic perspective. Uh, has to sort of blend together because the final product, the, the uh, narration or the voice work or whatever it is, has to still sound natural. Um, but figuring all of that out during the pandemic was probably the biggest challenge for, for me as, as a newer, newer narrator. At, at our studio at Radio Waves in New York City, in February of 2020, I had been working on a project and I had nine-tenths of my actors in the studio, and one actor 
who I absolutely had to have. I absolutely had to have him in L.A. And David was able to bring him in onto everybody's headphones so that they all thought he was in the room with him. With, you know, they, they all were, everybody else, and it, and it worked without this latency issue, which is this delay problem that happens. And it worked so perfectly that I started to say to him, hey, you know what, next project, I'm not gonna fly any actors out here. Screw those fees, I'm just gonna work like this. And then the pandemic hit, who knew? But we had practiced, <laughs> you know? And I just wanna tell this one quick story and then I'll turn it on. When I was sh working with my students in the first semester, a number of articles came out in the New York Times about how all these A-list actors who never would have considered doing an audio book, <laughs> all of a sudden were like, I'll take any work anywhere. And my two favorite pictures that I still show my students are Julie Andrews, uh, who does not like narrating, but she does this fun podcast with her daughter. She took one of her gown closets, and I say that word specifically, gown closets, in her home in Amagansett, and her son-in-law literally stapled pillows and blankets to the walls, and they pushed a table inside. She had a huge closet. It was for her gowns, after all. <laughs> and it became, it became, not her mini skirts, it became, you know, her podcast studio. And then my second favorite picture was Natalie Portman on the floor in what looked like the front hall closet with boots and coats and all this, a pillow and the microphone on top, and she's reading her newest, you know, children's book. So that's the thing about audio is that we really can, once we figure out how to deal with all the environmental issues, we really can be more adaptable. We can, we can record really anywhere. There, there was also a bit of, a, I, I've noticed there was a bit more leniency or flexibility for, because a lot of people were gum, coming into the home recording space as uh, newbies, as uh, new narrators or voice artists. And uh, from my experience, uh, my limited experience, I've noticed that there was a lot more flexibility in, from the producers being like, okay, we, we understand you're coming at this from a totally fresh perspective. It's okay if it doesn't sound absolutely perfect, uh, technologically speaking, but you know, do the best we'll you can. We'll fix it in Here the, mix. the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no such thing as a perfect audio book either. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess speaking from my perspective, as Sue mentioned, we started to experiment with what became our day-to-day -day work uh, life in a way, you know, from being in the studio primarily to basically working with people all over the world and, and trying to come up with a solution. And the, one of the positive things of the pandemic, it forced a lot of this technology to mature very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we had actually access to a lot more tools that allowed us to be able to work remotely was, you know, basically segueing from what I was starting just beforehand to having to really fully immerse. And I came up with a solution that allows us to do a lot of ensemble recordings where we'll have actors all over in various studios and without latency, they can respond in real time. If there is latency, the delay throws the performance, whether it's a musician, an improv actor, it doesn't matter what the performance is, but if you're able to have no latency and you have high quality recordings in each one of the home studios or wherever they're recording, when you bring them in to edit them, it sounds like they're really in the same room. One, because they're actually responding in real time. So that was one of the, the real positive things that it opened up our casting ability to basically cast from actors all over who we wanted, who we wouldn't in the past normally be able to ha bring them in because it was too expensive to the studio. Now, because everyone was forced to work from home, now we had them as like, oh, we've just expanded our casting list. We can have this actor that we wanted to have. And so time zones are tough because we had to have a studio in Paris at 10 a.m. We had to be in the studio at 3 a.m. to be ready at 5 a.m. when we were there, and then the studio, you know, it was just, yeah, not much sleep, but it was a very amazing performance that we were able to capture. We had a performer singing in New York to a person performing piano in Paris, oh, wow. 
and you With wouldn't singer, know. another singer in Paris. And another singer in Paris, which allowed us to actually capture this as if they were. And when I edit it together, you would swear they're all performing in the same room. So that's been the biggest boon for us, is to be able to now expand our talent base and the kinds of productions we're able to do. And knowing what those rooms sound like, like there's one actress that we work with from Wisconsin, and she is just beyond perfect for this character. So even though she literally hangs the blankets on the window as the trucks are driving by her house in Wisconsin, we know that that's her Achilles heel, if, it would, if you would. You know, that's her problem when we're gonna work with Clarice. So I've worked with the writer to make sure that whenever that character exists, there are trucks in the background. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just work with what you got, you know? You work with what you got. So in, in turn, <laughs> it's an opportunity. Exactly. How go. do I make this better art? <laughs> true, it's true. I mean, from when the pandemic hit, having a studio in Manhattan, I was given 48 hours. Basically, they were shutting the building completely down. I'd have no access to anything, and I had all these projects and work. So I had to dismantle everything in 48 hours, bring it home, and basically my dining room table became my mix room for the pandemic. Still so is. <laughs> it, I still do productions there because I'm going back and forth now that it's reopening a little bit. But, but the thing about being able to work with what you have and figure out how to make it work. I mean, I have also... Uh, some skill in, in building recording studios and sa soundproof rooms and, and doing a, the tech needs for all these remote people. So I just ha basically use those same skills on my own space to be able to make it workable so that the, the sound is good. I know, and it, you would never know when you listen to one of our productions that the actors weren't all together. Well, thank you for RX, you know, I mean, oh. uh, <laughs> um, RX is a program that helps mm -hmm. remove noise from recordings. Uh, it wasn't quite available. Uh, in 1995, when I was uh, with Harper Audio, uh, we bought three Sonic Solutions uh, workstations, and they only, they were, there were only two competing noise reduction programs at that time, No Noise, which was Sonic Solutions, and Cedar, yeah. which was- Ridiculously uh, expensive. <laughs> and, and not that, you know, not nearly as effective. $10,000 a box. And, um, but our, our we, we had a backlog of historical recordings that we wanted to re-release and, and improve the sound of them. Well, that same technology now mm -hmm. is saving these home studios that have a higher noise floor than what we're accustomed to. It allows us to uh, drop that noise floor without mangling the sound too much. Um, I mean, it's easy, to, it's easy to mess it up as it is to improve it, but um, it's much easier now to deal with that sort of thing than it was even just a few years back. And I think, I think it's that the, the software, like we have OBS Ninja now, like we did a presentation to the Audio Engineering Society in the middle of the pandemic where we had all these actors from, again, all over the country, we were demoing a new project and the fact that each actor could actually be seen as well as heard. You know, there's new technologies. What was that cell thing that we got from London that time, the sync cell program? You could listen as if you were in the studio right alongside. There's a lot of platforms now. There's a lot of products out there that allow you at, in a studio actually to send your full high resolution mix to someone to listen. So it's no longer a crappy stream where, or a highly compressed audio. They figured out the codex on two ends so you can actually send it. And what is funny is it's not that there's no latency. All the latency is matched up together. So it's all, everything is delayed, but it's all delayed perfectly in sync so that you don't know that it's there. And one of the <laughs> places that some of this technology came from was the European music community because they began experimenting on the internet with this collaborative composition work where you were in Germany and you were in Italy and you were in France and we all wanted to come together and from that software from some of those examples of how a person could collaborate in those ways we took oh gee look they're doing that let's adapt you know so we began to experiment showcase and then when the pandemic hit we found that it allowed us as david said to now have 
many more opportunities for casting. We met many actors who would normally not have participated. And I think it opened borders too, and it opened diversity possibilities as well. Microphone. Step to the microphone. Just to move away from technology for a moment, I'm wondering, have any new contexts appeared in the pandemic? I mean, so we have radio. Traditionally, there was radio. There still exists. It's uh, podcasts. There's audio CDs. Has anything new appeared in the terms of context for audio during the pandemic? You mean like distri distribution platforms or, or players yeah. or? Well, I, I'm just trying to take a step back. I mean, I'm trying to ask myself that question if I know of anything and I can't think of anything, but I figure if anybody, you guys would know. Has anything new appeared where, um, where, where the kind of work that we're doing in audio theater, just new ways to get it out, new contexts that, that hadn't appeared before? You mean like well, types of media? Yeah, uh, maybe it's Well, I, th like I think that what's happened is that, as Sue was saying, it, it's now been embraced, that uh, audio is now a real player because that's what the, um, the pandemic kind of forced people to stay at home, and audio was one of the things that was in high demand. So the, the need for more content to be created, so because of that, more people were getting involved in the industry. So the new thing is that now there's a lot more possibility in the industry for people to have a career. So here Podcast as, as an on-demand radio, basically, or the, the things that they're doing in some of the, the gaming or lit RPG or some of these other um, formats are becoming more uh, matured. And a lot of things got forced very quickly to mature faster than they would have. So that now you have the ability to get content in a variety of ways that you weren't really able to. So that's where I, I see it's more widespread. It's more embraced. So it's not just a niche kind of, you know, for, for people that are dis have disabilities or any kind of different, you know, you know, as far as getting audio. Now it's more mainstream. So when uh, David and I began the Hear Now Festival in 2013, there wasn't one place where audio, except the Audio Publishers Association, was recognized in any kind of a festival-like way. 2020 came, and first, South by Southwest began to accept work from audio, I believe it was in 2017. And then 2020, um, Tribeca, for the first time, accepted audio. So this year, we were in Tribeca. We had one of our pieces uh, accepted there. And Jim, I think what's happening is that everywhere in the world now, the Writers Guild have reinvigorated their audio division. The last time the Writers Guild East or West had any kind of connection to audio, it was radio plays. And when NPR stopped doing the Playhouse and the Ear and all those things, that relationship with the Writers Guild went away. It just got reinvigorated this year. So I think that the fact that audio now is recognized in every fest, every major festival as a, as a division of its own, and the fact that the Writers Guild is recognizing that this is now a place where people could again, you know, be making money. I think all those things are showcasing just how important we are to the entertainment industry. I also think um, that the being forced to work at home also allowed for a certain flexibility of hours when you were going to work, mm -hmm. um, which did two things. It made the on-demand feature of both podcasts and streaming and anything else, whether it's t uh, video, audio, whatever, uh, more available and uh, more sought after. Um, so, and, and the other, the two other things from that is one, the audio video quickly got, you know, the streaming programs, television programs, movies quickly bankrupted. They hit a wall because they couldn't produce anymore. Audio, podcasts and, and audio books kept producing. So we filled a vacuum that for some has become their new, p the new slot. It's like, I don't need to watch, I can actually, uh, and this has come 
in my case a number of times where an artist will actually say, this is what I'm working on as I'm listening to you. Um, or, I, you know, this is how I get through my day. I do, you know, he, was, he worked for the telephone company and he would be, yeah, um, I go in, I do my thing, whatever, I'm, you know, I listen eight hours a day. Um, you can't watch uh, and work, but you can listen and work. So two things that part of that was the technology of distribution when, when all of a sudden you can download and you don't have to worry about, you know, how, many, how much you can fit onto your cartridge or your device. When that, then all of a sudden everybody could get it and then solving the latency issue means that now we can, we can collaborate, which is the downside of, of audio is oftentimes that we're, we're working with one or two and now it's like, no, you can work with three or four. The fact that you can introduce a director to me <coughs> Uh, is the one thing, because I, it's the craft of narration is one that, that needs to be nurtured and takes a long time. Um, and to have that outside set of ears to just listen and say, because you get so caught up as a narrator in just the nuts and bolts of when do I breathe? How, you know, can I get that L and that R out without tripping over my tongue? Um, that I forget about the story and that director can say, yeah, you, you got the words, but I, I'm losing the sense of this. Or that's, that's that character. And, and for them to be there to kind of nudge you in the right direction or to say, take a chance. Go there. The, the text seems to be saying you really can make that leap. Um, that's exciting because I, it's creating the future narrator that is, uh, to a certain degree, very, very important and just takes time because um, you really have to work at this craft. I mean, I don't think, personally, I don't want to listen to anything I did in the first five years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't. Um, you know, I, I, I was, you know, I, I will say this, I was blessed with having the opportunity to work up with some great authors. They taught me how to narrate because the rhythms and the, but, um, those first five years, I don't know how many books I must have done, but, I'd like to go back and redo some of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. I mean, uh, even just, uh, I was uh, an audio engineer for three solid years before I joined Cadman, and I knew how to edit, or at least I thought I did. Um, and the first couple of audio books that I uh, edited were just, they were horrible because you, <laughs> you've got to learn, you gotta, you got to feel the pace of the reader and just, you know, and, and, and pace it out. The editor spends a tremendous amount of time, you know, and we don't talk about the editors too much. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of time. It's usually about three hours to every finished hour of, of editing, it was, uh, if, especially if it's not punch and roll. And, and that's my preference is, is to not punch and roll because I like having all those takes it right there in front of me. Because normally when I make a cut, Often I'm using the beginning of the very first take because the transition from the previous sentence is much smoother. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, editors spend a tremendous amount of time putting these things together. Uh, I was talking about we did On the Road uh, in 2000. And um, although it's a short book, it, because it was uh, clumsily read <laughs> is, is the best I can say. It took somebody about 175 hours to make it sound as good as it did sound. And it got a Grammy nomination, um, but uh, I'm not sure so many people listened to it, but um, there were great voices for the characters, but the person didn't do a great job with the narration. They had a problem. They got to the end of a line, they stopped and continued on the left. Now, if there wasn't a natural pause there, all the editing in the world can't make it sound uh, smooth. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, but at home, you know, these home studios, a lot of these people, they're working completely without nets. And that's what a director is. A director is a net. It's the safety net. You know, I mean, I can't imagine being a, a, a narrator at home. I would second guess every single choice I made for a voice. I, I, I'd never get off page two. Um, thankfully, I'm not a narrator. But you know, that's, that's a problem that a lot of people encounter. You know, they're, they're at home, they're working totally by themselves, 
and they they don't know if they're doing it right or if they're doing it wrong. And you know, they, they send it in and hope for the best. Um, you know. Well, and that's why I, while I do do solo narration work and all of that, that's why I always prefer the ensemble because you've got numerous opportunities. Like this one piece that was in Tribeca, when the actor who um, auditioned they were a different sex than the character was written to be. The character was originally written to be a man. This person sent in their audition. The, the co-director and I, the writer and I both loved it. And, and he was coming from stage. That's a big thing that happened during the pandemic. A lot of stage ended up in the, in the audio world. And originally he had hoped this was gonna be, Netflix had been talking with him about doing something um, as a limited TV series from his stage piece, but then it turned out the pandemic hit and he was sent my way and we ended up doing a limited podcast series. And because he had had this, this relationship to the work, he'd seen it on stage, he knew what his characters looked like, he knew, he thought what they sounded like. Then this audition comes in just has a first initial last name, we listen, we're like, oh my goodness, this, this actor, they really, you know, beautiful, beautiful job. And then the person shows up in Zoom and it's a woman. And we're like, hmm, how are we gonna, and the writer said, you know what? Are you okay playing a woman who identifies as a man? Because I don't wanna change the nature of the story, but I'm happy to morph the story. And she did. And so when we took it to Tribeca, one of the comments we got was the fact that the person who was moderating the panel, who was the new head of Audible Studios said, I don't listen much, I'm new to listening. She said, <laughs> uh, and all these other podcasts that are up here have like four characters at most in a scene and I don't find that hard to listen to. She said, but yours has 12 characters and I never got lost. How is that possible? And I think it comes down to the fact that the writer and the actors really brought those characters to life. And you know, the casting was my job. And I was really working with the writer to say, this person was fabulous on stage, not so fabulous on the mic stage, you know? And that's where I think you have to recognize that you know the audio industry really had an opportunity to shine and did. No, we, we did yeah. a, a book that had 122 different readers on it. And you know the <laughs> thing about something like that is, is besides the you know getting all that stuff to match, that's 122 contracts that <laughs> somebody in the back office has to deal with. <laughs> so they're not so thrilled to hear about a 122 person read. Um, and that's really, that's fairly new having these very large casts. We, my experience, you know, it was very rare that I had two people in the studio at the same time. Um, very rare. And there was, there was very little interaction. I mean, at least with, with Cadman, Harper Audio, and, and with Penguin Random House. Most of the stuff that I've done has been single voice um, but even in the earlier days, you know, we underscored stuff. We had music composed for every title mm -hmm. at Cadman. Um, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Then we went to music libraries. And then, but now we're turning stuff around and we're doing so much material that we just don't have the time for that sort of stuff. I mean, Penguin Random House, them, we are gonna put out approximately 2,300 audiobooks this year. I mean, that's more than Cadman put out in, in 30 years we're gonna do in one year, and full-length books. Um, it's, it's just incredible how this industry has grown um, and, and brought in, and the pandemic, again, has brought in a lot of talent that we never would have had because they weren't in cities that were on our maps. You know, it wasn't Chicago, it wasn't San Francisco, or LA, New York, and a few other major cities. Now we've got people all over the world that have talent that we were never aware of, you know, gifting us with, with great audio now, and, and it's great to be able to take advantage of that. And that's not gonna go away. 
that's still we're you know well and and working remotely is not going to go away no. you know um as many projects as we get in the studio i direct remotely as well you know and i don't have to leave home to do that so and, and also a lot of times the publishing industry doesn't want to pay for many actors and all that that's and, and we create a little more art than widgets it's kind of what our approach is and so we will do all of it, all as open role, because we feel we have the better performance. The actor's not thinking about they having to hit the mark, you know, um, and we understand it saves on editing time, so publishers like punch and roll for that reason. But as far as a performance, especially in ensemble work where you're really crafting some art, we always have open role because you, we want to choose where the edit point is in the material, and we want to make sure that it sounds, basically the actor is channeling the character, and if they're channeling authentically, then they have to think about the gain structure, you know, a clipping or all these other things, then they take some out of their performance. So we, we're trying to get the best possible performance that we can. And so the pandemic has really helped make this uh, more, the career path is there now, where you, before, you know, it's like, okay, audio is kind of, you know, not as respected, but now it's really becoming more highly respected and, and consumed and And, and it's exciting to see, you know, Audible Originals and all these things out there now that are producing these pieces that are multiple actors actually performing the work as opposed to, you know, the limitations that we had before because of budgets or times or other things. So. It is exciting to see that the world of podcasting and all of this has, has opened it up. Is everything great? No. There's a lot of not good stuff out there, but people are experimenting and that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, find? Uh, I was just going to say as, as an actor and a voice and a home producer, I also love open role. Um, because on my end, I've always found that it, it's essentially a way for me to have a second take. And then when I go back to do the editing, sometimes I'm like, oh, that third version is definitely the best one. So even working with your own voice where you know what you're trying to do and you know what you're trying to say at the time, then listening to it even an hour later, you go, oh no, that third one was infinitely better and I didn't think that it would be I thought it was just because I heard a dog bark on the second one but it's definitely the better take so there's always upsides to to all of those things but yes it does take much longer to edit open roll <laughs> unless you take good notes because mm -hmm. we I you know I train our editors by being PAs in our studios in our studio and on our projects so the PA's job is to make sure that if I yell out, that's the one, they've circled it. Now, of course, I've already circled it on my script, and whoever the recording engineer's done the same thing, but... And laid markers in the actual <coughs> timeline of the but recording session. The next time that PA sits down to edit, they're gonna remember that rhythm that I was giving them. They're gonna remember all those notes, and hopefully they'll be better editors. So we, we train them through a process so that by the time they get to editing, we can, we can get them where we need them. Which is awesome and kind of comes back around to that question earlier of why is it so hard to be a one-man studio because I can't take notes so easily while I'm in the process of recording because it's one more thing to try to add to all of the juggling that I'm doing with like knives that are on fire at a certain <laughs> point. Uh, <laughs> well, one of the positive things is that there's more, but one of the, the things about um, the reality of the industry being home narrators and expecting one man band. I mean, Richard also came up when we had a director, an engineer, an editor, a notator, all of those things. So you had all of those people to be able to listen. And sushi to. lunch. Right. <laughs> but, but the reality yeah. is, the reality is, it's still important to have other ears. You can't really criticize your or be critical of your performance while you're performing. You hear it after, like you're saying, oh, that was a better take. But if someone else is listening, they go, you know what, that, I, you, you lost it. You were no longer authentically you know, channeling the character and therefore, let's redo that one. And you wouldn't have known that if you were just reading in the booth by yourself. And uh, just, sorry, Sue, but sometimes as an editor, uh, the director would say, yeah, that third take was great. And I'm editing the t the, that title and I hear the third take and it's like, that's not as good as, as take two or take one. I, I cut in take one. I cut in the better take um, because I feel um, 
I'm as big, you know, I'm a part of that production. Um, I'm, you don't see me, you don't, and you shouldn't hear me in there. But it should be collaborative. But it, and you're but right, say, if you, you know, hear something better, then you should take it, yeah. You know, because you're listening in the moment. Yep. You know, it, it's, it's there and it's gone. And, and it might have sounded like a better take, but sometimes it's not. That's right. But when you're doing punch and roll, all you get is the last take. Yep. And, and if you need to go in and find the other takes, it's so much work to dig into that session. And that's why it's just nice to have it as a linear uh, piece of audio, so to speak. Um, but I'm sure your takes are, are right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, not always. There are times when he'll come to me and go, really? Yeah, let, let is this not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know what? Again. I'm collaborative, so I'll go, oh, you know, you're right, I missed it in the moment. And so I think it's really important to recognize every person's contribution in the process, especially the writer. I think, unfortunately, sometimes they're the people that get left out of the mix, is the writer, you know? Speaking, speaking of writing, um, I, I, one thing that's striking to me, uh, uh, David, I think it was you mentioned, or maybe it was Ryan, uh, you know, people say like, oh, you know, I, I, I listen to, you know, audiobooks and other audio works now all day when I'm working, doing other things. So, you know, after decades of our attention span shrinking, <laughs> getting narrower and narrower and being ruled by tinier, tinier sound bites, we actually have a situation which has increased our attention span. And I wonder, I wonder if that's something, I mean, do, do you... Do you have a sense of that in, in the, the writing that you're seeing for the... Well, I, th I think that it has to do with the material that you're choosing to listen to when you're on the or job. Or the choice of material. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, if you can listen to a romance novel while you're knitting, hey, and your job is knitting, that's great. But if you're trying to listen to something extremely technical... That may be distracting. So I think it has to do with the thing you choose to listen mm -hmm. to in the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about our attention spans. Well, I just wondered, you know, with in this situation, if people were, were writing and producing for that, know, knowing that, they're, that there's well, some people out there who can take one advantage of, the of that. that uh, from like broadcast medium where you had the sound bite and the, the, the commercials mm -hmm. and the, 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 the half hour spot, the one hour spot, with you know downloadable, you don't have to worry about being an um, an appointment listening. We mm -hmm. have to tune in and listen to a certain time. And yeah. Whereas the on-demand listener then listens on their own time. You're not stuck with whatever amount of time that has to fit in that mm -hmm. let's say broadcast spot. So in a lot of ways, that has allowed people, and with the pandemic forcing people to be like, I'm alone. What am I doing? Okay, now I can listen to long form and. Find the joy in yeah. getting fully immersed and engaged mm -hmm. in the story. Mm -hmm. you know, so in a lot of ways, that's the positive side. It, it has expanded our attention span rather than everything having yeah. to be just a, a short little bit. I, I also think you're talking about the difference between a visual medium and an oral medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because the sound bite works really, really well when you've got flashing, um, when you have a, a, a montage that you're looking at, you don't, your mind can't be taking in that information and the sound at the same time. So to a certain degree, audio has been a slave recently to the visual medium that we're watching, whether it's television or movies. Now you're going back into the oral uh, medium, which is, which is a whole, has a whole different operation um, uh, in terms of how it, how it functions um, and, and how it physiologically changes you as opposed to when you're watching something and then you hear sound. Uh, th there was an interesting article I sent to uh, Kim the other day. Um, it was a scientific experiment where a, a researcher in New Orleans would flash a whole bunch of images and one would be occasionally inverted. And they were mapping which part of the brain was responding and, and how quickly you could identify the inverted when she would do that while she was playing a soundtrack that had a steady rhythm, and when those inverted images were occurring on the beat, you were apprehending it much faster than if it wasn't. So sound 
and apprehension in rhythm uh, is really important. So maybe in terms of the uh, attention span, some of that has to do with when you've eliminated the visual, then the mind will go in a whole different direction mm. um, and is allowed to expand. But I do think it, a lot of it has to do literally with the material because uh, some writers write long sentences and you've got to figure out how to, to be the, you know, be the score be and phrase it so that it's very clear and it can still be enjoyable. Others, you know, if it's more than seven syllables, my God, that was a long sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, but I do think the sound bite is much more tied to the fact that you're also uh, uh, trying to absorb something visually. Well, one of the things that really my passion in, in audio is that when I make a production, uh, whatever portion of it is, and a, a person is listening to it. It's this very intimate connection that you have with that listener. So in effect, I am co-creating individually with every person who listens to the production I've crafted. So in a sense, and they're having their own very individual and very unique experience. They're creating all these pictures in their mind of what the character looks like to, based on what the story is or what have you. So that, 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 that intimate co-creation is just amazing to me that you have that, which you don't have it in the same way when you attach a visual image to. And so people during the pandemic were embracing that. So in a lot of ways, that was this, this, this kind of a renaissance of what we've known you know, in the oral tradition of how it is a way of telling a story and the person who's listening has this whole completely immersed, very visual experience in their brain. So that, that is just what's so amazing about this medium and why sound is my passion. To uh, build on what you were saying about the visual and, and the sound edit, one of the things, if you look at every Oscar-winning editor, they've always been the person that's worked most closely with the music and the sound producer on the film. Every Oscar-winning Oscar editor has an ability to understand the musicality and the, the sonic nature of, and, and match it up in such a way. It's really fascinating to recognize that that editing component comes first from the sound that they hear. I just want to ask a follow-up to Matt's question about uh, format. You know how there's now, short, well, of course there's short fiction, and then there's flash fiction, and there's even like one sentence Fiction. I mean, you know, I, somebody. I just saw a contest for, a, you know, a, write an 18-word piece of <laughs> fiction. So there's that. Is anybody doing um, very short? Sorry, Matt. On this, I'm going the other <laughs> way for, for where you were going with it. Very short format uh, theater. I mean, I, I did an experiment years ago. Maybe it was before its time, and it never cooked and maybe there was a reason why it never took. But it was two minute theater, a full piece. Is anybody doing that? Tom now? Lopez was doing stuff like that just a few years ago. Yeah, two minute theater. Two minute theater, yeah, where it's just the whole thing was in two minutes. Actually his first series Ruby was all like 90 second episodes. He strung them together and they became. But that was, Ruby was like 20 years I know, years but that ago. was drive time audio that they could throw a 90 second piece. So in a sense, and it was a standalone and yet he edited them all together and it became a long, you know, many hour piece, but it was each episode could stand alone by itself. I, I, anybody doing that now is what I'm asking. Actually in the podcast world, yes. Yeah, there are these little hits now that are out there. Um, one thing we learned being in Tribeca is that if you want to sustain an audio fiction podcast series and, and you want to sustain the audience, you can't go over an hour. You can't be under 25 minutes. They want, because they want to feel like they're getting, you know, enough content for their investment of time. And this. And that has to be a continue. You have right. to do it at and, least, but, you know, uh, every but, other week. But, you know, week like Hulu, all of a sudden reinvented broadcasting. We're only going to show you one episode a week. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, give me a break. <laughs> so, 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 you know, but the, that's happened in the world of podcasting too, Jim, that there's this, this, 
uh, audience. You know, it used to be if we weren't producing 27 hour audio books, nobody would take it from Audible because why would I use my one credit for a one hour piece? We would be told nobody wants that, you know? But now in the world of podcasting, you want something that's between 20 minutes and 55 minutes so a person can sit down and enjoy it and then walk away and do something else in fiction. And the thing about podcasts, when it started out, you had all these like little nerd niches, these little small audiences that have now grown, that each one of those niches is large enough to actually sustain a career. So you have complete networks now that focus on sp specific aspects of that. And in a sense, that then helped the audiobook world as well, because all of a sudden these listeners are getting trained for longer and longer content. Oh, now I'm going to dive into a full book. So in a lot of ways, what's happening is you're getting everything from like a, an audiogram on Instagram because you know if it's at 60 seconds, it'll play the whole thing. But if you're 61 or 62, it's going to pause. It's not going to show the whole thing. So you work within that limitation. So we'll do little teasers, a 60 second teaser to gain an audience to get people interested into whatever the production is. Haikus. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> um, First of all, thank you to all the panelists and thank you to our, uh, our AV crew there. Um, <laughs> uh, and thank you to my many colleagues here at the Library of Congress uh, who helped bring this event about. Some of them are still in the room, others are, yeah, already had to move on to the next thing. They are busy people, but uh, thank, you, thank you all. Um, and Elizabeth, I'm looking at you because <laughs> you're still in the room. So, um, so once again, to thank our panelists, Ann Damon, Richard Romaniello, Sue Zizza, David Shin, Michael Kramer, Ryan Dalisong.